good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Fordham. It's a great uh, honor and a pleasure to have you here, especially for a conference of this uh, magnitude and uh, of this importance. Uh, Fordham, Fordham, as you know, uh, some of you may know, is the Jesuit University of New York. So for 170 years, we have been devoted to educating men and women of competence, conscience, compassion, and commitment to the cause of justice. Therefore, it will come as no surprise to you if I say to you that we have always told our students that virtue is its own reward. But in the case of government, virtue is more than its own reward. As you are discussing today, virtue uh, and integrity are the found, uh, I think, the foundation of good government, yes, but also great progress can be made on the basis of integrity and economic life as well. So we at Fordham are especially delighted to have you here. We think it's a conference that Fordham feels uh, very much at home in. Uh, my job today is to thank you for coming and to welcome you. I want to say a word or two, though, about two men who will uh, succeed me or follow me to the podium. They'll actually go to the podium. Uh, the first is uh, the mayor of the city of New York, and he'll have a more formal introduction in a few moments. But I want to say a word or two, if I could, about him. Uh, he is, and he is not asking me to say this, I think he is the most remarkable mayor that we've ever had, uh, really and truly. Uh, he has done great things. He is a visionary. He is an honest man. He's not afraid to speak his mind, as we all know. And that has been, I think, for the good of the city. Uh, we at Fordham are especially grateful to him for the help that he gave us in getting our new building project next door underway. Uh, he broke ground uh, with us on that project last year, and I've already invited him back for the dedication, which will be in the spring of 2014, and I hope all of you will come as well. As, uh, through his visionary leadership, I think positioned New York very well for the future that lies ahead of it. Uh, he is a great civil servant, a non-politician politician, uh, and yet he is also a man, I'm gonna tell a story, that I've already warned him about, uh, that has a great human side. Last night I was at the YMCA dinner <clears throat> over on 42nd Street, and uh, the award winner was Dan Doktoroff. He got the Dodge Award for his great work for the YMCA. The chair of the event was Diana Taylor, and the mayor could not be there, and so he videotaped a welcome, and it was vintage Mayor Bloomberg. There was seriousness and great good humor and great affection all rolled into a very brief video. And after it was finished, Diana Taylor went back to the podium and she said, this is almost verbatim, what do you think of that mayor? <laughs> so cute <laughs> and filled with potential. <laughs> I want you to know, she said, he's gonna be looking for a job and I brought resumes for anyone who wants to look at him. <laughs> so, uh, but he really is, for the city of New York, a great, great treasure, and it's an honor always to welcome him to Fordham. Uh, now I also want to welcome to the podium Mayor Feldberg, uh, who is a key figure in this uh, conference, but also in the life of the city. Uh, Mayor, as you know, is the man who is largely and rightly credited for really making Columbia Business School a real force in the world of business education internationally. Uh, a man uh, like the mayor of great vision, a man who has never stopped working, uh, I think he works 24 hours a day, and a man of unquestioned integrity. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor not only to welcome you, but to welcome Mayor to the podium. Thank you, Father McShane. Now, you didn't say that I was cute. Diana said he was cute. Okay. I, uh, well, I'll ask Diana whether she thinks I'm cute. Uh, we are delighted and honored to be uh, at, at Fordham University. I did earlier this morning thank Dean Martin for uh, hosting this particular event. Uh, this is the 10th summit that New York City Global Partners has hosted. And of course, uh, the mayor has spoken at every previous summit. Uh, and we're delighted and honored that he is speaking at this summit. I should also mention that uh, prior to uh, the designation of a summit, uh, a brief is prepared and uh, it always ends up on the mayor's desk and he has to 
uh, approve the topic and the area that uh, the summit will be focused on. And uh, when we first started discussing the summit on uh, public integrity and corruption, uh, I started the discussion with uh, Marjorie and uh, Rose Gilhern, and I was a little concerned that it was a pretty controversial topic, and Marjorie assured me that the mayor had told her that this is a time to be bold. But I think the mayor is always bold uh, and cute. So uh, <laughs> it is now my uh, pleasure to introduce Mayor Michael R. Bloomberg, a mayor who has made accountability, integrity, and transparency the absolute hallmarks of his administration. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the mayor's previous career prior to becoming mayor of New York City. Uh, many of you, but not necessarily all of you, including some of our uh, visitors from, uh, I think, 27 countries from around the world, might not know that before Mayor Bloomberg ran for office in 2001, he spent uh, a long period of time, over 20 years, in the uh, business world. He started a small tech startup with two other people, a three-man startup, that became known as Bloomberg LP. Bloomberg LP now employs 13,000 people and has, since Mayor Bloomberg started the company, employed over 30,000 people and has employees in 160 global cities around the world. So pretty well every city represented here today probably has somebody in that city and some firm in that city using a Bloomberg uh, monitor on their desk. So this is uh, an individual who, who essentially was a job-creating machine for both New York City and for many other cities around the world. Uh, so he's brought really a, a trademark of entrepreneurship and, and the capacity to create and build enterprise. Uh, he leads now a global city with uh, 300,000 employees in city government, uh, almost eight and a half million people, and with a budget of $70 billion. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor R. Bloomberg is the 108th mayor of the city of New York, and it is my pleasure and honor to welcome him uh, for this conference. Thank you. Um, You'll pardon the play on words. This is the not, not the first time I've done this from one mayor to another, which is similar when I play golf and they, somebody invariably says, Your Honor, Your Honor. If you're not a golfer, you wouldn't understand it. It's, your Honor goes first, but whatever. Anyways, um, I did want to announce that we're serving uh, 16 ounce drinks of full sugar <laughs> drinks outside. If you want uh, 32 ounces, just take two of them. It's not that complex. Uh, we have an awful lot of city uh, commissioners and uh, people here, but I, I did want to point out that uh, the two, uh, are, you, are you and Rose the chairman of this or something? Um, the two chairmen had to bring along a relative, my sister, her brother, and Rose, her father. Mr. Gill, we're happy to have you. Um, let me also acknowledge our fellow mayors, four of them who are with us today, the Honorable Antonio Jose Ledesma, uh, the mayor of Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, His Excellency Hussein Nasaluta, uh, Director General of the Dubai Municipality. Uh, the Honorable Annabel Ganarid Garria, the Mayor of Medellin, Colombia. And the Honorable Reg uh, Regis Labombe, Mayor of Quebec City, Canada. And also to all our global partners who have come here for this conference, let me say with typical New York humility, welcome to the greatest city in the world. <laughs> After all, I am the mayor. I don't think he expected me to say anything different. Um, the, uh, my sister has uh, worked as hard as anybody can to uh, work with the Consular Corps and the ambassadors in New York City. Uh, for those uh, mayors outside of the city, um, we have our own foreign policy here. 
We don't pay much attention to what goes on in Washington. Since the United Nations is here, we probably have more diplomats than they do, uh, and they're certainly more ha happier to listen to us, I think. Uh, I did want to also acknowledge Professor Esther Fuchs of Columbia University. Esther, are you here? There you are. Uh, she's a professor at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. She was, worked in our administration for the first four years. Uh, to say we couldn't have done it without her is true. Whether we would have done a better job without her is uh, questionable. Uh, my way, come on, you're not going to get away with this. And uh, Father McShane. I don't know quite how to roast Father McShane. I have been a friend of his for many, many years. He serves on the board of Bloomberg Family Foundation. Um, does he keep me on the straight and narrow? I'm not sure. Um, the Society of Jesus has never asked me to become a priest or a brother, but you know, you never know. I would tell a joke, but it'd probably be tasteless, so I'll, I could have a collar. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, and I did want to thank Seriously Fordham for hosting this conference and uh, uh, one of those utterly in keeping with this school's proudest traditions because when it comes to preventing the abuse of public and private authority for personal gain and to provide public servants with unquestioned integrity, I think there's few schools that can match the record of Fordham. And two particular examples leap to mind. The first is John uh, Ferrick, distinguished former dean of Fordham Law School and author of the Ferrick Commission Report, a seminal work on strengthening honest government in New York City. And second is someone whom you've already heard from today. She is not only a graduate of Fordham Law, she is also, in my opinion, the finest leader that the New York City's Department of Investigations has ever had. This young lady down here, everybody thinks is in her mid-20s, probably late 20s, but she looks like her mid-20s, <laughs> Commissioner Rose Gilherm. <laughs> like Fordham, her agency has a proud history. Uh, today, it ha as it has for nearly 140 years, it aggressively protects New York City taxpayers from deception and fraud, and we recently saw some prime examples of such work when, in cooperation with federal prosecutors, uh, it secured repayment of hundreds of millions of dollars in fraudulent overtime charges associated with instituting the city's computerized timekeeping system. And in that case, the Department of Investigation exercised its authority in exactly the right way, without fear or favoritism. In addition to its investigatory work, Rose's agency also plays a crucial role in educating city employees about their obligations to report corruption and in helping close the door on opportunities for such corruption before it occurs. And those efforts are complemented by the excellent work of our city's conflict of interest board and also by many steps our administration has taken to strengthen integrity in city government. They include new lobbying reforms and limits on campaign contributions from those who do business with the city. And taken together, they express our determination to give New Yorkers a city government whose integrity is beyond reproach. I think it's fair to say that when you pick up the paper and you read about somebody getting arrested for fraud or doing something that's not allowed in city government, you want to tear your hair out. But we do have 280,000 employees and I don't think there's a city in the world with 280,000 people that doesn't have somebody arrested every day. So in that context, we're probably doing pretty good because we manage one every other day, something like that. <laughs> Seriously, uh, I'm very proud of the uh, job that our 280,000 employees uh, do here and their honesty and integrity and dedication and hard work. And every once in a while, there are some bad apples. And the issue is not, uh, do they exist? They're always going to exist. The issue really is, do we find them and do we prosecute them? And one of the things that I've had a policy with Rose on uh, from day one was she is not to talk to me other than to say hello passing in the hall. The only thing I ask her to do is just before there's an arrest, if I'm going to get a question about it, tell me about it. But I don't want anybody to ever think that there's been any pressure from anybody in our administration on her and her work. She's supposed to be independent, and I don't know that anybody's ever had somebody quite as independent as she is, and I hope it's a model for future administrations. This is the way it should be. So, Rose, thank you for everything you've done, and I know Cardoza keeps you on the straight and narrow occasionally, but then he has a right to be wrong, too. You've always told me that. That was fun. Only Cardoza would appreciate that in Rose. Um, as this conference demonstrates, city and local governments around the world 
uh, like those in Hong Kong and Quebec, whose work has already been presented today, are on the same page. And that welcome, that's welcome news coming at a historic moment because it coincides with the incremental, uh, the increasing urbanization of our planet. Today, for the first time in history, the majority of the people on Earth live in cities and that trend is rapidly accelerating. In fact, it's estimated that by mid-century, up to three quarters of humanity will be urban dwellers. And whether or not authority has been devolved to cities, we remain the level of government closest to the people. And in democracies, voters therefore hold our city governments accountable for the services that affect their day-to-day -day lives. And as chair of the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, that's something that I see uh, the city leaders uh, everywhere tell us. Uh, cities have long been the hub of commerce and in the globalized economy, we're, incre we're, we're increasingly where the economic action is. The cities of the United States, for example, generate 90% of our gross domestic, domestic product and 85% of our jobs. And the same pattern holds basically in the rest of the world. Tokyo alone, for example, accounts for a third of Japan's GDP, and Mumbai produces 40% of the tax revenues in India. And with that growing economic power comes, unfortunately, greater opportunities for corruption at the city level. And that makes it imperative that cities everywhere develop and support strong, independent public integrity measures and institutions, measures and institutions that harmonize with such strong international agreements such as uh, OECD's Anti-Bribery Convention and the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Effective anti-corruption efforts in the private sector, including those of the International Chamber of Commerce, as well as the codes of integrity carried out by many leading multinational corporations, and also the indispensable work of leading non-governmental organizations in this area, Transparency International. As we intensify our work, uh, we have a particular responsibility, I think, to lay the rest, to rest three insidious myths that allow corruption to flourish. The first is the myth that corruption is somehow a victimless crime and that no one really gets hurt by corruption and that's what's all the fuss about. Let me try to answer that. Corrupt corruption is in, in fact, victimizes everyone not just one person. I've always thought that corruption is worse than somebody walking in with a gun and holding up the store. Corruption takes, basically without the gun, takes away from everyone. Uh, I have worked in both the uh, government and the business sectors, as you know, and um, the people often ask, always ask me what the difference is, and my standard answer is that business is a dog-eat-dog -dog world and government is just the opposite. But you can tell how smart a crowd is. You use that line and you wait to see how long the, anyways. But uh, the best uh, tool for debunking that myth that corruption is a victimless crime, I think, is transparency, uh, bringing all of its evils into the light. And just starting with the fact that, as the World Economic Forum has reliably estimated, corruption siphons off more than 5% of global GDP every single year, the equivalent of more than $2.6 trillion. So it's money that's uh, not being invested pr um, productively and not generating jobs or not being used to improve public health, public safety, or other essential services. In the private sector, uh, corruption increases the cost of doing business, it distorts the market, it deters investment, uh, it stifles innovation by penalizing un uh, entry-level entrepreneurs who lack connections or deep pockets, and it can cloud or even ruin the reputations of otherwise respected corporate citizens. Little wonder that firms to test and avoid doing business where corruption is rife and uh, embrace transparency as an economic asset. In the public sector, corruption can skew government priorities by, for example, shortchanging funding of effective but low-cost programs in favor of big-ticket projects where the opportunities for rake-offs and kickbacks are richer. Corruption also victimizes everyone in society. For example, it often weakens enforcement of laws that protect all of us against pollution or shady construction of the infrastructure that we rely on or even from being preyed on by violent criminals. And at a fundamental level, confidence in the law is really the foundation of democracy itself. And the cynicism that corruption breeds among city employees and the people they serve 
really does sap confidence in and support for government and the political process. When citizens believe that their government is corrupt, they disengage from the activities essential to democracy's very survival. Voter turnout declines, so does respect for the law, and in the worst case scenario, people start taking the law into their own hands. So the dangers of corruption are clear, and so is the first step towards combating them. One of our nation's great jurists, uh, Louis Brandeis, once famously wrote that when it comes to preventing corruption, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And in killing the victimless crime myth, transparency is the best way to make its true costs and the steps that we're taking to stop them apparent to all. Now, even some who recognize these tolls taken by corruption shrug them off as saying that corruption is a necessary evil, a cost of doing business if you want to, quote, get things done, unquote. This seeming realism is the second myth that I think we have to discredit because a true realistic view of corruption shows that it doesn't permit economic progress. Instead, it impedes it and ultimately destroys it and where bribes and kickbacks are a cost of doing business, progress is made in spite of such corruption, not because of that corruption. Corruption creates myriad inefficiencies, delays, and costs for businesses, and at the macroeconomic level, corruption is ruinous. Healthy economies are sustainable and self-renewing, but corruption prevents those processes from taking place. It closes off opportunities for small businesses, it undermines free markets, and it makes a mockery of the competitive forces that spur economic growth. So it is a perverse myth that corruption is a catalyst to progress. And efficiency is an effective ways to get the lie, to give the lie to that myth, streamlining regulatory processes and eliminating red tape and bottlenecks prevents corruption from taking root. It creates an environment that demonstrates to businesses and government agencies that do thing, that can do things promptly and well without requiring bribes or other favors. The third myth is that cities can and must help explode, uh, that we must help, uh, help and explode, is that corruption is simply inevitable and therefore beyond our power to eradicate. And as with many myths, there's an indisputable grain of truth here, and that is that we are not and never will be saints. No offense intended, you will be, but I will not be. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I never wanted to be, but that's a whole other issue we can discuss offline. Uh, people will always be tempted to cheat, lie, bribe, and find new and imaginative ways to game any system to personal advantage, but that is no excuse for complacency. Crime will never be eliminated either, nor sadly will disease. Nevertheless, I think we've shown that we can do a lot to prevent both and in the process save lives and make lives better. We can also do a lot to prevent corruption and its poisonous effects. And the key is replacing a culture of complacency about corruption with a culture of accountability for preventing it. And that's a big part of the mission of New York City's Department of Investigation. They tirelessly and effectively reach out to city managers and employees, letting them know about their obligations to report and report suspected corruption, and also about the legal protections we extend to those who step forward. There was a great philosopher, Rabbi Abram Joshua Heschel, who once wrote that a democracy, you know, when terrible things happen, uh, in a democracy when terrible things happen, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And I think that directly speaks to the subject of corruption, because when it comes to ensuring integrity in government, we not only must identify and punish the few engaged in corrupt activities, we also have a strong responsibility to prevent corruption from occurring at all. And we can do that by attacking the myths that allow corruption to flourish and by promoting transparency, efficiency, and accountability at the city and local government levels. And I wanted to salute all of you for your commitment to achieving these goals. I wish you all a successful conference. And if I had uh, God ask me to like, grant one wish, I would say make all levels of government 
feel exactly the same ways about preventing the conflicts where people take campaign donations from agents, from uh, industries they regulate, where people expect campaign donations in return for voting for specific pieces of legislation, and where they make a mockery of investigation and ethics panels that uh, are dis deliberately designed to protect everybody who works in government rather than to go after the handful of bad apples. God bless. Have a great conference. And Rose, thank you for everything. Thank you.